So hi everyone and welcome to this video on perfect price discrimination, which is the very first uh, type of price discrimination that we'll discuss through this course. So uh, perfect price discrimination or commonly referred to as first degree price discrimination essentially involves selling each unit of a good. So a monopolist will sell each unit, unit of a good at the consumer's reservation price or essentially the maximum willingness to pay of the consumer for a particular unit of output. And what we'll note is that the purpose of doing this is to be able to get the entire amount of consumer surplus, to be able to get the total or to extract the total amount of consumer surplus from each consumer in the monopolist's quest to be able to maximize profit. And to do this, okay, the monopolist uh, should be able to subdivide its market uh, to such a degree that it's able to sell each successive unit of its good for a price equal to that reservation price. So if you think about it, it knows the reservation price of each consumer or the consumer's maximum willingness to pay, it needs to be able to subdivide its market such that it knows that reservation price first and foremost, and it's able to sell at that exact reservation price. So, uh, and you can think of it uh, geometrically, and we'll illustrate this later as sort of the height of the demand curve. And we can think of this demand curve, which is faced by the monopolist, as some sort of willingness to pay uh, schedule. And it's this willingness to pay schedule of its consumers that represents the amount that consumers are, willingness, are willing to pay for the units that they purchase. Now, of course, since the demand curve slopes downward, the consumer buying the first unit is willing to pay the highest price and the second consumer buying the second unit uh, as at a slightly lower price and so on. So the maximum willingness to pay declines with each successive unit purchase. So to view that more clearly, let's start with an example. So say we have a, a discrete demand case. Okay, so suppose the monopolist has a total of six customers and the monopolist knows the maximum out amount each person uh, is willing to pay. So. Uh, the first customer is willing to pay, uh, say, $6 or 6 units of currency for one unit. So there's one consumer that is willing to pay um, $6 okay, for just a unit. Okay. Then we have also a consumer who is uh, the second consumer okay, uh, is willing to pay $5 for that or five units of currency for that same unit so that's somewhere here okay then we connect then so on so we have the third consumer okay third consumer is here then the fourth consumer willing to buy at three then the fifth consumer willing to buy at two then the last consumer willing to buy at one. Okay, so if you think about it again, it, the, the demand curve, okay, it essentially follows again the law of demand, which is as quantity in uh, as price increases, quantity demanded decreases. It's just that now we view the demand curve as sort of uh, the preference set of a particular consumer of particular sets of consumers. So there are people who are willing to pay high prices for low quantities and people who need to have more quantities to be able to swallow a certain amount. So if you connect the demand curve, it looks uh, something like uh, this. Okay, so we can connect, okay. And th th that line that I'm sort of drawing, okay, is uh, the demand curve. Okay, so this is our demand curve for this case. And it looks like a staircase because uh, Again, this is a discrete case. So in this case, this is demand or effectively your marginal uh, revenue. Okay, now, how would the monopolist okay, price its uh, product to be able to maximize profits? Okay, so uh, in this case, since we are under perfect price discrimination, so the monopolist will price its product, okay, it would charge the consumer 
with the highest reservation price, a price equal to that person's uh, reservation price. So for example, okay, for the first person, so our first consumer here, that uh, the consumer's reservation price is equal to $6 or six units of currency. Therefore, the monopolist will charge that consumer $6. So uh, that's $6. Then for the second consumer, okay, the second consumer, uh, the monopolist will charge this person uh, $5 since that person's willing to pay for it at $5, that unit. Then for the third consumer, okay, the third consumer, the person will be charged $4 because that consumer is willing to pay for that much. Now, if you notice, we have a marginal cost curve here and that marginal cost curve is something that's constant and that's at 4 so the monopolist wouldn't have too much incentive to sell beyond the third consumer because it would operate at, uh, at some sort of loss. So just to recap, the monopolist would charge the consumer with the highest price, a price equal to their reservation wage, which is six or the reservation price rather, which is six dollars. Then uh, you can effectively capture the entire consumer surplus. Okay, so for example, if we were to operate under a normal monopolist, we would equate it MR equal to MC, and that might equate a price, of course, below $6. In this case, some th probably uh, it's going to be $4. So that consumer would have had a consumer surplus of $2. But then since you charged exactly equal to their reservation wage, you were able to sort of extract that entire consumer surplus. The same goes for the second highest reservation price who will be charged $5 and so on and so forth. Consequently, the monopolist's marginal revenue for each unit okay, is the same as the price of that unit. So for the first unit, the MR is equal to $6. For the second one, that's equal to 5 For the third one, that's equal to 4 Okay, And... Uh, this firm's okay, marginal revenue curve is effectively the demand curve, right? So again, uh, we have a marginal cost line here or marginal cost curve equal to 4. Okay? And it means that the monopolist is willing to sell up to the third unit, right? As I said earlier, since the respective MR okay, are greater than or at least equal to that firm's marginal cost. Thus, like any profit-maximizing firm, a perfectly price-discriminating monopolist produces up until the point we're in, MR, is equal to MC. So we still follow that rule because it's still a monopolist. So it will produce up until this point here, up until that point there, and uh, it's going to end after that. So if the firm has supposedly no fixed costs, so... It will sell three units. So since this is the final quantity, so um, it's going to be if the firm had no fixed cost, then the total cost of the firm is equal to three units. Okay, three units times uh, the marginal cost, which is four dollars. So that's going to be equal to twelve. So what's its total revenue? Well, the total revenue it gets is how much it sold. The first unit, well, it sold the first unit for $6. It sold the second unit. Okay, so this is $6. Then it sold the second unit for $5. Then it sold the third unit for uh, $4. So that's uh, 6 plus 5 plus 4, which is equal to $15. So if I do total revenue minus total cost, that's equal to profit, which is equal to $15 minus $12. This is equal to $3. So it has a profit of $3 in this case. And what we'll notice is when we do the next graph on the next slide, the, uh, the, the entire consumer surplus was swallowed or was extracted by uh, this monopolist who practiced perfect price discrimination. And that same, this same type of analysis can be used for the more conventional continuous demand case. So... Um, so let's analyze and recall a few concepts uh, before we begin. So uh, if you recall, okay, uh, we're, we have three cases, perfect competition, monopoly, and perfect price discrimination. So under, um, under a perfectly competitive market, okay, so it's going to be 
P is equal to MC. So the condition is P equals MC. So we have equilibrium somewhere here. So we have this one being, uh, say, QC. Okay, then this one is going to be equal to PC. Okay. Now, under a uh, monopolist, okay, under a monopoly, okay, we have MR is equal to MC. So we find that intersection that's somewhere here. Then we, uh, we place the price and the quantity. So the quantity will be this one, say QM. Okay, and then we'll have this price, which is PM. Okay, so we have PM there. And then, uh, so note this PC here, okay, that we had is also equal to the marginal cost, right? Because that's the, um, uh, that's the point of uh, where in the profit would be somewhere at around break even. So let's uh, sort of draw a few lines, uh, a few letters here so that will guide us in our analysis. So let's put A here, B, uh, then let's have here C, then this one would be D, okay, then this one would be E. Okay, so let's have those areas that we have here. Now, let's start first with perfect competition. Okay, now, the consumer surplus under perfect competition is this entire triangle here. That's A plus B plus C. Uh, and the reason why there's a consumer surplus is because there are people who are willing to pay a higher amount, but instead paid the market price, which is the, the perfectly competitive price. So it's a high consumer surplus. And uh, what we'll notice is the producer surplus in this case is uh, the, uh, the, the profit. In this case, there's still abnormal profit and that's D plus E. Okay. And you'll notice that if we add consumer surplus and producer surplus, we get welfare. So that's A plus B plus C plus D plus E. And we know since we're operating under perfect competition, okay, that there is no deadweight loss. So that's zero. Now for a monopolist, okay, again, we're just reviewing concepts here. The consumer surplus is much lower, right? Because uh, th there's already some form of extraction uh, because of the charging of a higher price. So since we charge PM, our consumer surplus is just A. Then uh, because of the because of the increase in uh, price and the monopolist's behavior, uh, it has a producer surplus equal to B plus D, okay? And if you add the two, uh, the two up, you get welfare, which is A plus B plus D, okay? And we know that if the monopoly, if, if it's a monopoly, there's some deadweight loss, which is this triangle here. So that's the deadweight loss which is C plus E. Now, in a perfect price discrimination environment, okay, you'll notice that uh, the entire welfare, okay, the entire welfare, uh, because the monopolist knows exactly the reservation price of each and every one of its consumers, it can reap the entire okay, consumer surplus and prevent that deadweight loss. So essentially, it's going to get the exact same. So this is the case for a, a perfect price discrimination. It can get this entire triangle, okay, and meaning that it has no deadweight loss and the welfare is just A plus B plus C plus D plus E, okay? Now, what is the consumer surplus under this case? Well, it's zero because... If the monopolist knows exactly that, that person's reservation price, it can charge it exactly that. For the consumers willing to pay $6, the monopolist will charge $6. So the consumer surplus of that consumer would be zero because they paid exactly their reservation price. So what happens to producer surplus? Well, it's in fact the entire area. That's why it's the most profitable, okay, the most extractive out of all of the price discriminations because if you know exactly okay the 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 reservation price of each consumer you can reap all of it as profit 
And clearly, in this case, the firm is able to extract the entire consumer surplus. I transformed that consumer surplus to producer surplus and therefore to higher economic profit. And essentially, that's how perfect price discrimination uh, works. So just to summarize, uh, perfect price discrimination, it's efficient from a welfare perspective because there's no deadweight loss. So efficient. Okay. since uh, no deadweight loss. And to an extent, it's better, okay, better than a pure monopoly, okay? It's better than a pure monopoly, but it raises some income distribution questions, i.e. the effect of uh, perfect price discrimination is for the producer to extract the entirety of consumer surplus as profit, so will the gains uh, be rechanneled from several consumers to one party or just entirely to the monopolist? And uh, another thing for just to take note is that it's an all or nothing choice. So all or nothing. Okay. And essentially, uh, it, do we consume uh, the demand uh, and pay uh, for that price? Or do we consume nothing at all? So will the consumer with, uh, who has a reservation price of $6 uh, pay it at $6 or, consume, or opt to consume nothing at all? So uh, in that manner, you know, it raises some questions. But uh, again, this is the most extractive form of uh, price discrimination. So it's in one way. Uh, supposedly uh, more efficient because there's no deadweight loss. But again, uh, it raises some concerns as to uh, the income distribution if you look at it from a more realistic standpoint. So in the next video, we'll discuss an actual mathematical example of this. And I think uh, we'll get the concepts more clearly when we have that math example. So thank you for watching and thank you for your attention.